everyone to the call. Um, special welcome to our new providers who are joining us for the first time. Uh, we're very excited to have you uh, with us. This is the Crisis Best Practices work group. Um, we have been meeting since December uh, every month to talk about different areas of our services and how they function and, and what's different from one state to the next. Um, and uh, we have another um, exciting uh, agenda for today. Um, going on to our, our second slide, we're going to be uh, doing a spotlight on the uh, NetCare Access Crisis Stabilization Unit, which is called Miles House. Uh, Carrie Weirich will be um, uh, spending some time telling us about her programs. Uh, today's content overview will be on funding, um, how our crisis programs are funded, um, what are some of those um, unique challenges that we face in funding, how are programs diversifying their funding, evolving their funding streams, um, and then we'll do a brief review of our project plan and our timeline. Um, for those of you that are calling in to the, um, the, the 800 number, the 844 number, um, please just make sure to mute your phones when you're not using them and to not put us on hold um, if you have to uh, take care of some, some other business uh, so that we don't have um, your wonderful hold music, which I'm sure is beautiful, um, but we just don't want to hear it um, right now for the next hour or so. So as we've said from the beginning of our, our, uh, our work group, our purpose is to develop a comprehensive toolkit for crisis services, what some of us call crisis residential, other of us call crisis stabilization or facility-based crisis, um, uh, uh, acute treatment units, all the wonderful different names that we've talked about. Um, and so this toolkit is being informed by providers across the country. Um, before we get into kind of an update, I want to mention uh, a save the date for uh, a free webinar that TVD Solutions is going to be offering. Uh, the webinar is called Innovative Practices in Effective Management. That will be Tuesday, July 18th um, from 1 to 2 p.m. Um, anybody that's on our calls or any other managers that work in your organizations um, are welcome to be a part of that. And we'll be sending out uh, meeting invitations uh, the week of June 26th to our listserv. Um, if you have other people that you'd like it to be sent to, um, my email address is at the end of uh, this uh, these presentation slides, but it's Travis A at TVD Solutions.com, and I would be happy to get them signed up as well. So, uh, overview of where we're at with our workgroup participants. Uh, we uh, excitedly continue to add um, states, um, and as a matter of fact, there's even some updates um, on this map since uh, we put it in here. But uh, we now have participants from Minnesota, um, from North Dakota. Uh, we're up to 35 states now uh, with 115 participants. Uh, we want to welcome our new participants. Oh, in Kentucky as well. I, I don't want to forget Kentucky. Um, we want to welcome our new participants from Kentucky, Minnesota, um, North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Virginia, Texas, California, and Pennsylvania. Uh, we're gl very glad to have you uh, joining in on our work group. Um, I am going to turn it over to uh, Carrie Weirich from uh, NetCare Access, and she is going to be spending some time telling us about uh, their crisis programs. Uh, so, Carrie, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Hello. Um, hi, folks. This is really exciting to be part of this. Um, do you want me to take control of the... There we go. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's exciting to be part of this work group, and um, it's exciting to hear what everyone else is doing. Um, NetCare Access is um, in Columbus, Ohio, and um, we're the safety net, uh, and that's where uh, NetCare comes from. Uh, um, our name is NetCare for the safety net. We actually have um, two different uh, crisis um, as it said, um, but um, um, we have a crisis stabilization unit and a separate uh, house called Miles House. So we're actually going to talk about two different places. Just to give you some background on what NetCare Access, where we are, and um, what we do, um, we provide crisis services for all of Franklin County in Ohio. Franklin County is in the center of Ohio. It's roughly that blue area with the arrow. Um, and it's 1.32 million um, uh, people, and the city of Columbus is about 832,000 of that, and uh, the city of Columbus is the most populated um, city in Ohio. Next slide. 
So when folks are in crisis, they call our crisis phone line. Uh, that's our emergency response service. We also have a chat line for that. We um, handle about 70,000 calls a year. Um, then they come to our uh, crisis unit. And this is really set up um, very much like a psychiatric emergency room. Um, it's a psychiatric emergency services. People could stay up to 23 hours there. Basically, at this point, we're assessing them, we're treating them um, with medication um, uh, if they need it um, um, to help um, help calm them down if they need it. It's basically their entry into the system, and from there they might go to a hospital if they're that acute. They might go home, or they go to our crisis stabilization unit. After they leave the crisis stabilization unit and when they're ready to go um, to a lower level of care from the hospital, they, come to, they can come to Miles House. So today we're going to talk about the crisis stabilization unit and Miles House. Next slide. Okay, our crisis stabilization unit um, has 10 beds and um, we're pretty programming heavy. We've got um, a lot of activities for our clients to do, a lot of group counseling, um, uh, access to art. Um, uh, it's adult men and women, uh, 18 and older. It, they have to have a primary mental health diagnosis, although we have a lot of folks with dual diagnosis and it is an alternate to psychiatric hospitalization. They have a maximum of a seven-day stay in our crisis stabilization unit, our CSU, but the average is around 3.5 days. They get linked to community mental health agencies if they're not already linked. That happens in the CSU. Next slide. We uh, served in 2016, we served 680 clients uh, in the year. Um, like I said, we have um, try to offer a variety of things for folks to do. We have a small gym um, uh, where they can play basketball indoors. Uh, we have a courtyard outside and we try to offer um, uh, yoga with um, uh, kind of processing and introduction to yoga at least once or twice a week. Um, we're staffed daily with either a doctor or a nurse practitioner um, who um, does rounds nearly daily on every client. 24-7 nurses. Um, we have LPNs in the evening and an RN during the daytime. And then, of course, we have social workers, counselors, uh, peers, and in Ohio, we call our techs qualified mental health specialists, but it's basically like a tech. Our treatment philosophy is um, uh, illness management and recovery, and we have some limited um, skills training from DBT. Basically, what we're hoping folks accomplish when they're in our CSU is um, get um, stabilized and get, um, get um, connected for outpatient services. They'll get started on um, antidepressants in uh, the crisis stabilization unit and um, their linkage with community mental health will follow that up. So they discharge with seven days uh, worth of... Next slide. Miles House, actual house, um, and it's um, uh, located here in Columbus, actually about a mile away from our crisis stabilization unit. And folks who leave our crisis stabilization unit but still need more um, uh, support go to Miles House. We also get people who were very acute they first came to our crisis emergency services and went to the hospital. So Miles House is actually a more heterogeneous uh, mix of individuals. We have quite a few folks with uh, psychosis at, at Miles House, recovering from uh, psychosis. It's nine beds, adult men and women. We have um, group um, counseling and activities about four hours a day. It's for individuals with uh, primary mental health, although we do have a lot of folks with uh, mental health and alcohol and problems. Um, like I said, it's a step down from our CSU or from the psych hospital, 
and um, it's a maximum stay up to 16 days. About the average length is 13, and we serve um, uh, 233 in um, in 2016. Next slide. Um, it is um, it's a little bit more open in terms of our yes with our CSU people stay with the CSU 24/7 for those three to seven days. At Miles House, they can come and go. So they could go to a job interview. They could um, uh, go meet with their physician. They could go to a peer center or an AA meeting. Um, Miles House is on the bus line, and um, we um, uh, give our folks five bus passes um, for their entire length of stay, and it's up to them to kind of budget how they use bus passes. passes. Um, with Miles House, it's really good in that we have a link to an opportunity for transitional housing. A lot of our folks are homeless, and um, um, we have a, a priority with um, a transitional housing agency that's not us, but it's a, another agency where we can get some folks uh, linked that way. We use illness management recovery, and we really work on connecting individual with support in the community. Um, we'll bring in outside agencies to um, meet um, with individuals there at Miles House, and then um, we encourage them to go experience uh, the other agencies in the um, We have 24-7 staff, um, and we're um, uh, staffed with mainly social workers, counselors. After hours, we have techs, and um, we also have peers during the day. And in the, for the past couple of years, we've had a part-time nurse who is there uh, seven days a week, but uh, just for a few hours a day. Next slide. So um, Travis asked me to talk a little bit about how uh, we fund our services at our CSU and at Miles House. And um, Ohio has a system where um, there is a tax levy for mental health and that is run by the um, county board, Mental Health, Alcohol, Drug Abuse, and Mental Health Board. And um, they are um, positioned to fill the gaps as much as possible. So they'll pay for individuals who don't have Medicaid, and they will pay some of what Medicaid won't pay for. Um, but as it is with everyone, funding and um, health insurance and Medicaid is in a big flux right now. Um, next slide. <laughs> so um, at the our county board's urging, um, they've encouraged us to uh, negotiate contracts with managed uh, Medicaid um, because if it just bill for your face-to-face -face time, it doesn't cover 24-hour uh, supervision, the, um, the cost of housing an individual and acting with for several days. So we've worked out some contracts with some managed care providers, but that's a real challenge. Um, and also, of course, it's a flux because of the Medicaid expansion. Next slide. Um, uh, Ohio was a Medicaid expansion state, which is fantastic um, because we uh, really got a whole lot of people who never had access to uh, uh, Medicaid before. They got Medicaid. Um, one of the unintended consequences was there were too many individuals seeking um, hospitalization now with Medicaid, and there were too few hospital beds that could take somebody with, with Medicaid. So that caused a gridlock in our crisis center, that's our psychiatric emergency services center, and then spillover into um, our CSU. So we've, we've taken some of the crisis people as holdovers while they're waiting for like a detox bed in another facility. So that's impacted us. So that's really challenging right now. Um, of course, we don't know that the Medicaid expansion is going to act. Uh, next slide. So um, in response to the shortage of hospital beds, we've had a lot of private hospitals move in, and there's something called the IMD, 
um, that has, is changing July 1, which will allow hospitals to take uh, individuals with Medicaid. Um, but now, um, who knows, it may be that Congress may cut the Medicaid expansion. So um, the, the system being in a real flux is uh, really hard for us to plan, as I'm sure everyone else can relate to. Next slide. So in addition to the funding challenges that we have that I think we share with other folks, uh, also we have some staffing and turnover challenges. Um, with hospitals coming into the area, they can pay a lot more. And uh, NetCare has a reputation in our area of having really great staff, which is great bad because people can woo our people away. Um, I do have to say, though, that our turnover is less in the um, crisis stabilization unit and miles house than it is in the crisis unit, just because I think the work is more rewarding because we get to see people get better over time. And the people in the crisis unit, they're just dealing with the worst part of the individual um, uh, crisis without getting the benefit of seeing them get better. Another challenge that we're dealing with right now is Ohio uh, is really a hub for the uh, opiate epidemic, and uh, we are concerned about our um, our clients that they um, have uh, opiate use. Um, we're getting all of our staff trained in uh, the use of Narcan, um, and um, we're, we're, the law changed permitting us to keep Narcan at Miles House. We have 24-7 nurses in CSU, um, and the clients are a little bit more contained there, so that's less of a risk. But um, the opiate epidemic is huge. Uh, there's not enough resources in our area for um, your opiate treatment. Another challenge for us is um, the housing shortage. Um, Columbus um, Landlords tend to evict people rather quickly, and then once you have an eviction, then it's really hard to get housing. And then we individuals and all that have real difficulty maintaining the lives of house. So um, that's uh, going to be next slide. Some exciting things that we're doing is um, um, our peers, our, uh, our peer, we actually have one peer that runs back and forth between our CSU and Miles South. He is fantastic and he is in great demand all the time and um, um, that it's really made a difference, I believe, in the lives of our clients having um, his uh, input and uh, being someone who has lived in a homeless shelter and he can say, hey, when I was in the homeless shelter, this is how I stayed sober, this is how I took my meds, and avoid these people and talk to these people. So that's super uh, important. Um, new hospitals coming in will mean a lot more choice for clients and it will mean that um, uh, Miles House will, uh, you know, be able to work with more, more hospitals to bring people to Miles House, so that's good. We also have been the benefit of a um, of a grantor who just focuses on improving the looks of residential set, um, centers, and uh, they're fantastic. And they've uh, rehabbed our Miles House, and they're um, going to they've funded rehab for our CSU. They're all about beautification in terms of um, uh, a beautiful setting can make. Um, they can help people get better. And I can give you information about them if you're interested. Uh, it's a group called Melissa's House. And then the uh, last thing is that I'm really proud that NetCare is um, embarking in the Zero Suicide Initiative. And um, that's really going to help us enhance our current programs and um, uh, decrease uh, suicides in um, uh, people who have left our, our services. The basics to zero suicide is using evidence-based practices for screening, assessment, and treatment of suicidal ideation, basically looking at suicide as suicidal ideation, kind of like you'd look at cravings from an individual who is addicted, ways for, the, for them to cope with those suicidal ideation, and then follow up 
and um, um, following up with individuals have discharged to make sure they get to So that's um, that's net care in a nutshell, and you're uh, welcome to email me if you have any questions, and be happy to answer them for you. Carrie, thank you so much. Um, this has been really helpful to hear about your program. I, I do want to take a couple minutes and open it up uh, for questions that anyone might have for Carrie. Can you talk about the um, Alyssa's House, the rehab um, funder? Yeah, yeah. It's a um, it's a, a a family foundation that. Um, they lost their daughter uh, at a mental illness. She had a severe mental illness. Um, and originally, they planned on building a residential treatment center for her in her name. Uh, but they ran into not, not in my backyard issues. And so then they decided that they would take the, their um, um, wealthy family and they decided they would take their money and they would um, um, change the way treatment looks because throughout their daughter Melissa's uh, life and treatment history. She was in grim, dreary places. So um, they've um, they've been wonderful to work with. They're very passionate people, and um, they fund. Um, you know, we did a rehab of a kitchen. We did rehab of a of living rooms. We're doing. Um, uh, just, they like. Uh, improved lighting so it's not fluorescent lighting they like um calm colors it's it's, a, it's just a very uh, positive experience thank you and uh, uh you, you come up uh melissa's house dot org i believe and if that's not right um send me an email and i'll send you their information and if you could just identify what um, program you're calling from and your name, um, it'd be great to know uh, who's who's asking each question. Thank you. This is Andrea Kosis from Human Development Services of Westchester in Westchester County, New York. Great. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, Carrie, one question I had for you was about the environment or the locations of your four crisis programs that you mentioned. Um, are, are any of, are the CSU, Miles House, Emergency Response, or Psychiatric Emergency Services, are any of those co-located or do they share a campus or anything like that? Well, the, the um, Emergency Response is just a call center. So that's, that is a, a crisis phone line. And that's located um, at, in the same building as our crisis services. And our crisis stabilization unit is, um, on the same building, it's a different wing, and then Miles House is down the street. So, okay, for three years, Miles House is apart. Got it. Thank you. I have, <clears throat> sorry, I had an additional question as well. Um, my name is Elon Javentard. I'm calling from Los Angeles uh, at CD Hirsch Mental Health Services. Um, in regards to the Miles House, I'm wondering if there's a reason um, that the maximum stay is 16 days. Is that a funding? Yeah. Um, that's a funding yeah. thing? Okay. That was and um, it's, um, the idea is to um, a turnover of beds available for um, new folks to come in. Thank you very much. I'm just curious of the providers that we have on the um, on the call today. How many are involved uh, or taking some action steps related to the zero suicide initiative? This is Fisher Darlin from Home Care in Wichita, and we are actively um, working on that and have changed kind of our outlook as an agency to the zero suicide outlook. Right. Great, thank you. This is Rebecca Bowder with um, Parts of Services in Kentucky, and we too have just attended a uh, Zero Suicide Academy 
is what we're looking at, improving our screening tools as well as getting staff trained in um, evidence-based practices. Excellent. Thank you, Rebecca. This is Jamie Webster with Community Reach Center in uh, Colorado, and our agency also participates um, in zero suicide. Awesome. Um, any other questions for Carrie? Okay. Um, Carrie, thanks again so much. I really appreciate learning about your program. It's really encouraging to hear about the work that y'all are doing, and it sounds like um, you have no shortage of things to do with um, trying to um, stay in front of the curve in your hospital expansions and your, your uh, potential changes in, uh, in, in healthcare and, and everything that's been going on in the last few years. So um, thanks for spending some time uh, sharing those things with us. Okay. Um, before we go into our um, our content, I wanted to just kind of show a screenshot, and um, I apologize this, if you're not um, uh, if you're not in on the the Skype um, uh, presentation right now, then you won't be able to see this. But I'll explain it as best as I can. So we've been taking the information that we have from our um, uh, our, our research on crisis programs um, and our conversations, and we're starting to do some mapping of crisis services across the country. Um, so we have um, all of the, the crisis program locations, for example, that we've been able to find um, in the United States, as well as um, most of the psychiatric hospitals. Um, we've started to kind of put into an interactive map. Um, it's not online yet. It, it, it probably will be on our website in the next few months. Um, but this just kind of gives you an example um, as you kind of hover over different parts of the country, um, you can click on a program, you can see the name of it, um, who it's operated by, what, what type of program it is. Um, so we'll, we'll try to do some distinguishing. I know for those of you that have been on the calls for a few months, um, our, some of our taxonomy conversations, uh, we've, we've had to try to distinguish like what is a crisis uh, residential program in one state, and what is a crisis stabilization program in that same state, and and how do our you know how do the names differ? Um, so what what we'll eventually be able to do in this platform is um, show some distinctions on, on what type of program it is um, at the psychiatric hospital level. We might be able to show whether it's a freestanding hospital or whether it's a, a unit on a, on a part of a larger medical hospital. Um, and eventually can, uh, I mean, we, if once we have the available, the, the access to the data, um, we'll be able to look at, um, uh, you know, we can really add any type of crisis program in here that we'd like to, um, whether it's mobile crisis teams or uh, crisis call centers, um, so that you can get an idea, like, if, if you zoom into a community, you know, like, what, what might that community look like? So um, if, we, if we just, you know, if we zoom into um, to Columbus, where, where uh, uh, Carrie's located and is talking, like, how, can we find out what kind of hospitals exist there and how many crisis residential or crisis stabilization units exist in the state? Um, so there'll just be some cool things that we can do and to try to understand. And then, as you, you know, if you know the metropolitan area that your programs cover, you could compare them to what type of services are available um, in other um, in other states. So. Um, just something to keep in mind, again, this is very early beta kind of work that we're doing, but um, I think could provide some really cool resources at our fingertips to understand um, how programs work. So um, going back into the slides, uh, we are going to be talking about funding today. So you can kind of see the, uh, the topics that we've covered since our first call back in December. And um, today we're going to talk about how programs are funded. Um, and also about the challenges uh, that to keeping those funding streams fluid and then what uh, programs are doing to uh, maintain sustainability, um, to move from just a, a survival model to, to a thriving model. Um, and also, uh, um, you know, what, what are some other like cost saving measures that, that programs do? Um, so this month, uh, of the 115 participants that we have, we have 28 responses. Um, our responses are falling somewhere between 30 and 50. 
um, for every survey that we send out. Um, it's important to remember that um, because this work group is is founded or based on uh, kind of this um, this community sharing um, uh, principle or just this approach of um, of crowdsourcing information um, and not so much on the the institutional knowledge of of experts, you know, like a handful of experts. Um, our results for our survey and the information that we have to inform the building of this toolkit really comes entirely from our participants. So the more people we have responding to surveys, um, the more rich our information is um, and to, to inform our conversations. Um, so the first slide that we have up here is about sources of funding, okay? Um, and about 70% of the programs that responded uh, said that they had that Medicaid um, is a part of their funding sources. Um, a little over half reported uh, using county funding, um, a little less than that, maybe a third reported state funding, um, a few, maybe 15% or so reported using some Medicare funds, and then uh, some reports on state grants and foundation grants and donations um, were also given. Um, as far as the other funding sources that were identified, um, there was regional funding that was from a respondent in Iowa that said that the state is kind of um, broken up into like four regions or so. Um, another mentioned consulting fees, um, a commissioner's court, uh, private insurance, which we'll touch on in a slide in just a little bit. Uh, the 1115 waiver, which has uh, helped to fund a lot of programs in the state of Texas, and then self-paid clients um, at a sliding scale rate. As far as the referral sources for people who are on uh, who are receiving Medicaid funding, 58% uh, reported uh, their Medicaid funding comes in a fee-for-service model, which is uh, a bundled rate. So you're getting your nursing, your, your uh, clinical work, your medications, your um, psychiatry visit, all together in a per diem rate, um, similar to what you might see at a, a, a psychiatric hospital. Um, 40 Five percent reported um, being in a uh, an unbundled rate, so that your your everything is listed out. Um, everything's kind of a la carte. Whatever services you receive, then you're going to report each of those individually um, to uh, uh, to bill for those services. And then twelve and a half percent also reported using a federal Medicaid waiver, um, using our excellent math skills in charts and graphs who recognize all of these do not add up to 100, they add up to more than 100. Uh, so some programs have diversified funding streams even in Medicaid where they might be billing a daily rate as well as getting some sort of um, uh, uh, like block uh, grant or block um, amount of money. Um, a couple of the comments that were that came out of this slide we're, uh, you know, we bundle all we can, but if an individual doesn't get prior approval for crisis residential, then we bill Medicaid for the services that we can. Um, another program reported that they maintain a per diem rate with some managed care providers. Uh, so in the fee-for-service model, uh, if you are not keeping your beds full, um, then you're not making money in a lot of cases. And so we posed the question about cost settling. Um, are uh, crisis programs uh, cost settling at the end of the year if they're not getting the referrals that they need, um, which can affect their bottom line? Um, and there were 17 programs that reported um, that they exist in a fee-for-service arrangement. Of those 17, 30% uh, of them said that they do report uh, cost settling, um, but the majority, 71% uh, said they do not. Um, I've heard of program, sorry, go ahead. Yep, so what we mean by that is um, that uh, a, a provider will create a budget at the start of the year on what their projections are for utilization or for census data. Uh, a lot of the programs nationally uh, identify a benchmark of somewhere around 85% or maybe 90, 90%. And so then they will um, estimate their budget based on those numbers. Um, if their uh, referrals are down or if their length of stay is short um, and they don't reach that 85% goal um, amount, 
then at the end of the year there could be a shortfall between what they projected for their uh, their revenue or the reimbursement, and then what the actual um, what the actual uh, reimbursement or, or um, utilization was. So then the provider will have a, a conversation with the payer, um, sometimes the community mental health center or um, or the county, to say this is what we projected we were going to utilize. This is uh, what actually happened. We have a shortfall of you know it could be a uh, it could be any amount of shortfall, and uh, we'd like to find a compromise so that we can keep this program sustainable. Um, maybe the referral sources or the payers had some sort of skin in the game to say, we will give you X number of referrals in a month or, or in a year um, uh, to, in order to keep your beds full. So um, a lot of times this is a measure, uh, especially for programs that are kind of running at the margins, um, that can be the difference between them um, continuing on for another year or uh, not really being able to, to be sustainable. You're welcome. Um, moving on to our uh, contracting with private health plans. So we pose the question, does your program contract with any private health insurance plans? Um, a third of the respondents said yes. And three of the programs, the excuse me, the health insurance plans that were identified were uh, Magellan Care First, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Kaiser, and Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, Jamie Webster uh, from uh, Colorado um, works at a program that uh, has a contract with Kaiser, and so I wanted to just give Jamie uh, a couple minutes to just kind of talk about what you know about that contract and, and how often you get referrals from private uh, health plans through Kaiser and um, just just any other details that uh, about your experiences in working with that health plan. Yeah, thanks Travis. Um, so to kind of give a little bit of background, our crisis stabilization unit is a non-locked but secured 16 bed facility. We do accept people on involuntary holds. Max length of stay is five days, and we're adults only. Um, prior to December 1st of last year, we billed all of our services individually. Um, and at that point, when we had an individual referred to us from an emergency department or from any one of our crisis walk-in centers, um, per our contract with the state, we would take everybody, regardless of insurance. Um, after they were at our center, we would then send bills out, and if the you know Kaiser or someone decided not to pay, then um, we just footed the bill. And that wasn't working for us, so we decided to create a bundled rate um, based off of the code that Medicaid in our state would pay for. Um, and once we had that in hand, we then went to Kaiser and said, you know, on average, uh, we get about three Kaiser clients in our CSU every month and did a cost comparison with them. So we really sat down and said, our program is asking for $510 a day for our bundled rate, um, and we're taking individuals that are on involuntary holds. If they were to be sent to a higher level of care to an inpatient facility, you're paying a lot more than that. How would you like to contract with us to pay our bundled rate? And they agreed to that. So. Um, our process is that anytime that we receive a referral from Kaiser, we always do get an authorization from them prior to accepting. Um, they have not turned down anyone yet, and we're hoping to take this process then to other private insurances as well. And Jamie, do you get a sense for um, how often um, a person with Kaiser insurance gets referred to you? Yeah, right now, um, with Kaiser, we are averaging about three consumers a month that are referred to us. We, interestingly, don't get referrals directly from Kaiser itself. The way that our crisis system works in the state of Colorado is that um, we have a statewide crisis system that does its own advertising and invites anybody from anywhere to walk into one of our crisis centers at any time. And so that is where we get all of our um, referrals from Kaiser from actually is individuals that just need that crisis help and they come into a walk-in center and happen to have Kaiser insurance. 
Do you get a sense um, for, or did you do you know like what in type of information was brought by your organization to Kaiser? Like when you made this proposal, like did you have any outcomes data or like research or like anything that you brought to the table for them to make a compelling case for your services? Yeah. Our finance department and uh, chief financial officer were really the ones that had that meeting, so I'm not privy to all the details, but I do know that they presented um, you know, every single service that was included in our bundle rate. They broke down the individual costs of those services as compared to what we were asking for for that bundle rate, compared that to the prices for inpatient stays across the agency, um, and they also brought outcome data on how our crisis stabilization unit helps individuals to step back into the community and wrap services around them. Can I ask a quick, quick question? This is Dan from San Diego, CRF. Yeah. Uh, just, thank you. Uh, for the, your bundled Kaiser rate, does that include medications or are they provided by the Kaiser Pharmacy? Um, medications are provided through our pharmacy, but we bill separately for those, or they come out of our formulary cart that's um, on our unit. Okay, so your bundle rate doesn't include medications for the Kaiser patients? Kaiser. Correct. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Jamie? Yeah, this is Carrie from Columbus. Um, what state are you in? Colorado. Okay. Thanks. Um, cool. If there's not any other questions, Jamie, thanks for that insight. I think that's really helpful, and that's going to inform um, a little bit more of our conversations. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, going forward about uh, partnerships with uh, with private health plans. So. If we go ahead and move on into um, the the question about diversifying your funding streams, we, we asked uh, participants, how is your program diversified funding streams, right? Um, the Almost 50% said that funding sources really haven't changed significantly in the recent past. Um, but uh, some other response responses, about 25% says said that they've increased the number of Medicaid referral sources, so contracting with neighboring counties. Uh, reserving beds, um, having so having a, a county or a, a, a local uh, partner um, pay for a bed, and if it's if they want to keep it open, then they have to pay for it to be open, basically. Um, and we've seen that in Michigan, uh, there's a provider who has really um, done a great job of like increasing their uh, referral sources by going reaching out not just to the neighboring counties, but reaching out four or five counties away to say. If you need a crisis residential solution, um, we can do that for you. And if you think about it, you know, let's say that your referral source is only sending you uh, enough uh, individuals to keep your your census at like 75%. Um, you, you have to find those little ways to get that extra 10% if 85%, for example, is your goal. And uh, if, your, if your funder isn't going to help in a cost settling um, arrangement or if they're not sending you the services or maybe you control um, part of the continuum and you provide really good prevention services or you have a really great mobile crisis team and not only do they keep them out of the hospital, but they happen to also keep them out of your crisis program. Uh, then uh, finding those creative ways to still keep your beds full or, or to make ends meet uh, with, with your finances uh, can be critical. So uh, about 20% reported uh, being awarded new local, state, or federal grants. Um, and then a little under 20% re reported that legislative changes have directed funding towards crisis services that allow programs to be developed. So that can happen kind of in one of two ways. That can happen because you um, because your programs have been noticed, let's say by a, a legislator that has made them a priority. So we've seen that in California and Texas in the last five or 10 years where the funding uh, for either startup costs or ongoing costs for crisis services has really increased. Um, or you see it happen in the wake of a tragedy, um, such as in Virginia, uh, where the, the, the crisis continuum has really been scrutinized um, after a, a legislator's uh, son 
um, uh, died uh, related to a, a, an incident with mental illness um, because he couldn't get into um, a bed and in, into a psych hospital bed. And it turns out there were available psych hospital beds in other uh, in other parts of the state at that time. So that just speaks also to that bed board conversation that we had uh, last month about uh, being able to have good access to programs and not being siloed in your attempt to, to refer people into crisis services. And then about 15% of the respond, respondents said that they've been working with private health insurance plans, whether through a, a pilot project or a contract, whatever it is. Um, there was a response about direct admissions um, from referral sources happening uh, through bypassing the screening assessment. Um, and I thought that was an interesting um, approach and I'm wondering if any other uh, providers who are on the call today have taken that, uh, tr tried to get creative with your admissions process um, or take, taking such a measure like bypassing a screening assessment? Um, we have several outpatient locations outside of our crisis residential programs and other wraparound services that the agency provides. So if somebody is being referred internally from another section of the company, um, we'll bypass some of the screening tools and intake uh, information because we're already under the same umbrella to discuss with them the case, so we're just speaking directly to the other provider rather than having to put the client through additional screeners and intake assessments. Got it. It just, it just, it just it, it gets somebody in a lot faster and gets them the services quicker rather than having to go through the, the ringer again to get into the program. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, getting, getting through the last few slides here, uh, so talking about decreasing costs, um, there was a number of responses uh, that uh, came out, out of ideas or, or ways that programs have tried to decrease costs. One uh, was adding or increasing interns, about a third of the programs mentioned that. Also the use of food pantries or engaging in energy saving initiatives um, like new windows or, or energy saving thermostats. Um, about a quarter of the respondents said that they haven't engaged in any cost saving measures in the recent past. Um, and then a few other responses had to do with accepting donations, um, maybe having to reduce staff or diversify people's roles, um, as well as adding or increasing volunteers. Um, a few of the specific responses that were given uh, were uh, that consulting services have helped to fund additional services in, in the continuum, um, that, that Managing a, on a shoestring budget is just kind of a way of life and it's been kind of something that's been accepted. Uh, furlough days for all staff, so my understanding of furlough days are like unpaid uh, days that people have to take off, so maybe like the day after Thanksgiving um, or some other uh, days uh, that, that were, were just work just wouldn't happen on that day. Um, and then applying for local grants for food, um, hygiene products, and clothing items. And that can even happen not just by going to like a, a foundation locally, but to find out if, uh, if, if a, a, a product supply, uh, supplier or like a Procter & Gamble, like if they might have any um, uh, grants that you can apply for, or just the ability to get some free um, products like uh, you know toothbrushes or cleaning supplies, hygiene products, whatever it is. Um, so the, these were some of the responses related to sustainability amidst challenges. Um, one, one program said that being CARF accredited carries a lot of weight in the, in the area. Um, managing overtime has been uh, important for another provider to keep costs down. Um, one, one provider wrote, improvise, improvise, improvise. So just being able to be adaptable and recognizing that you know the things that we had going on six months ago might not be the same. Um, uh, one of the providers from Arizona mentioned uh, outcome incentives, um, so being able to get like an additional payment. We've talked about that before, I think, on our calls as far as using metrics to um, help to get some uh, incentive, uh, like bonuses or or additional funding for meeting certain uh, benchmarks or metrics. So we're actually going to be continuing this conversation in another call, um, in a webinar that we're going to be doing um, in the second week in July. Uh, we're still working on the date, but we kind of got a little bit of the provider perspective on funding 
Um, but specifically with health plans, what we're going to do is have two um, health plan uh, representatives that are currently contracting uh, with uh, crisis programs like the, like the ones we have represented in our group to talk about what their experience was like um, entering into a contract with, health, with, with a, a crisis program and also uh, what would be some good tips to bring to the table if you're a provider and you want to start contracting with a private health plan. Um, how to you know, have a really effective and meaningful conversation, what kind of data you should have ready to present, um, and then what a healthy partnership might look like um, between a private health plan and uh, crisis services. So look for that invitation to come out um, probably by the end of next week um, for uh, the, the, the second uh, week in July, that, that second full week. Also, uh, again, a reminder, uh, SAMHSA's got a great set of uh, webinar trainings on um, trauma-informed innovations. Uh, they're happening on the last Monday of each month through September. Um, you can click on that link uh, or, or type it in uh, to get information about them. Unfortunately, they don't create their own calendar invite, so you have to pu put it in manually into your own calendar, um, but some good information there. Our next conference calls uh, are Friday, July 21st at 1 Eastern and Wednesday, August 23rd at 2 Eastern. If you want to email the group list serve, you do that by emailing crisisresidentialnetwork at tbdsolutions.com. Uh, and our website is uh, crisisresidentialnetwork.com. We will have today's meeting slides, slides stored there, as well as a recording of t uh, today's phone call. Uh, we are also starting to get our, phone, our, uh, our calls uh, uploaded to YouTube. So we have our March phone call uploaded right there right now, and we will have the rest of them uploaded probably by the end of the month. Um, if you have any questions, again, feel free to email me. I'm the project lead. Um, for uh, for this project. Um, that is all we have today. Thanks so much for your participation. Thanks to Carrie and Jamie for sharing information about your programs. And we will talk to you again uh, next month. Mm -hmm.